Deuteronomy 14. Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. These are the beasts which ye shall eat, the ox, the sheep, and the goat, the hart, and the roebuck, and the fallow deer, and the wild goat, and the pegarg, and the wild ox, and the chamois, and every beast that parteth the hoof, and cleaveth the cleft unto two claws, and cheweth the cud among the beasts that ye shall eat. Nevertheless, these ye shall not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the cloven hoof, as the camel, and the hare, and the coney. For they chew the cud, but divide not the hoof. Therefore they are unclean unto you. And the swine, because it divideth the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud, it is unclean unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. These ye shall eat of all that are in the waters, all that have fins and scales shall ye eat. And whatsoever hath not fins and scales ye may not eat, it is unclean unto you. Of all clean birds ye shall eat, but these are they of which ye shall not eat, the eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey and the gleed and the kite and the vulture after his kind and every raven after his kind and the owl and the night hawk and the cuckoo and the hawk after his kind, the little owl and the great owl and the swan and the pelican and the gear eagle and the cormorant and the stork, and the heron after her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat. And every creeping thing that flieth is unclean unto you. They shall not be eaten, but of all clean fowls ye may eat. Ye shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Thou shalt give it unto the stranger that is in thy gates, that he may eat it. Or thou mayest sell it unto an alien, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. Thou shalt truly tithe of all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herd and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, and for sheep, and for wine, and for strong drink, and for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household, and the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come, and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand, which thou doest. Deuteronomy 14, an interesting chapter. Uh, some of us glaze over some of these types of chapters, but nevertheless, I think there's some good spiritual truths in here that we can definitely apply to us as New Testament Christians. Last week in Deuteronomy chapter 13, we mentioned the uh, dangers and hindrances that can come into our lives when we're serving God. So there were different things where God would allow some hindrance to enter into our lives in order that he could prove us to determine whether we would serve him or no. So 
the walk with God isn't always an easy one. God has ordinances. He has rules. Some of them are confusing. Some of them make us scratch our head and wonder why in the world would God set this rule or this law forward. It doesn't make sense to us. Especially sometimes the laws don't make sense to us sitting here in 2020 looking back at something like this and saying, oh, whoa, what in the world? And then you, you don't necessarily wonder why some of the scholars or liberal Christians look at this and say, ah, this is archaic, this isn't for us. But I believe every word of God is pure and is intended for us today. It's eternal. There's nothing in the word of God that's going to expire. Nor can I ever get to a point in my learning of the scriptures where I just go, ah, you know what, I've got that figured out. I've already talked about this. I've already preached about this. I've already studied this. I'm going to leave that aside because certainly I know all there is to know about that particular passage. And Deuteronomy 14 is one of these where I've read it a bunch of times. And even in my study of it this time, I got more out of it than I did the time before. And when I go to it again in my Bible reading, I'll get more out of it than I did the time before and the time before and the time before. And that's going to continue until the Lord comes and gives me full understanding when I'm with him in heaven. Because this book is eternal. This book is God, the Bible says. You're never going to finish this book. And the man that says, oh, I've, I've exhausted all that I can of this book, mark it down, he's full of pride. This book should humble you. The more you know of the scriptures, the more you should say, I know nothing of these scriptures. And I've witnessed men that, I, I remember a man that came to one of my churches uh, years ago, and he would, he would preach only scripture verses with a closed Bible. And so he wouldn't add his, his, his uh, dialogue. He wouldn't add his words. He would just stand there and from memory say scripture verses for the entirety of an hour-long sermon. And it was like point by point by point flowed as if he was preaching. It was like the very oracles of God there. And if you talk to a man like that in his 90s, he would say, I know nothing about the Bible. He would have the attitude of the Apostle Paul, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. Any man who thinketh he knows a thing knows he knows nothing at all. I just, I just quoted that, you know, I probably butchered that one, but that's essentially what the Bible should teach you. You think you know something? The most important thing you can know is that you know nothing at all. So God shows in the previous chapter that our flesh, our false brethren, our family, and our factions that enter in our lives, they're there to prove us, to essentially challenge us, to encourage us, to take the next steps for God. God lets these things into our life so he can make us stronger as believers. The Lord wants essentially chapter 13 and verse 4 to come to pass in fruition in everyone's life who would name the name of Christ. 13 and verse 4, Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. There's your marching orders as a Christian. <laughs> Fulfill all that in perfection. Tell me you got that verse figured out, okay? The Lord wants us, nevertheless, to be challenged and in that direction. When he rebukes and chastens us, it's, it's to that end. He wants, like verse 11 says, And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. He wants you to be different than the nations that are surrounding you. Where you live, you ought to, you ought to stand out like a candle in a dark room. Because why? You're ser searching after God. You're seeking after God. You're walking after God, fearing Him, obeying His voice, and all these things. And above all things, you're just hearing Him, what He says. Fearing His very presence and, and influence in your life. He wants you to do right. He wants the fulfillment of then, 13 and verse 18, at the end there, do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. And at the end of the day, you ought to be able to lay your head on your pillow and say, I've done right in the sight of the Lord thy God, my God today. I've done right right. His eyes will look on me and say, yes, amen, he's done right. You know what? If you've done wrong that day, before you lay your head on your pillow, just say, Lord, forgive me for this and for this and for this. And you know what? God gives you a clean slate and you'll go to bed, done right in his eyes. Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not most of them, not part of them, all of them. All of your unrighteousness. So keep a short tab with God. Of course we all sin. Of course we all fall short. But if you are constantly seeking him and constantly asking for that cleansing power of his word in your life and constantly repenting of the sins that you do fall into, he will look at you as one that does right in his sight. And it will be commended. Okay. Now on to chapter 14. Who are we as believers? The Bible says, Ye are the children 
of the Lord your God. And this is one of my favorite illustrations when I'm soul winning, is to bring people to the point where they can compare my child or even their child, sometimes you can make it more personal with that, to the relationship that God the Father has with a believer. It's a father-son relationship. It's a parent-child relationship. The Bible clearly says here, even in the Old Testament, ye are the children of the Lord your God. How does that work? Well, Galatians 3 and verse 26 says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So even in the Old Testament, you think God contradicted his word, or do you think that these were that were the children of God were the same way? I believe it was the same way, through faith in the Lord Jesus. They look toward and forward to a Savior. We look back to a Savior, and both are faith positions. None of us were there when Christ hung on Calvary's cross, died, and rose again, okay? There was a very small group of people that were present. Everybody else has to, has to rely and believe by faith. They, too, had to believe and get saved by faith, of course, it was a little bit easier for them, though, because they had seen the Lord Jesus show with tangible proofs. But at the same time, was he, just, was he just entertaining a horde of believers at that time? No. Even when it was happening in front of them, they still rejected the faith that was offered to them. Okay, so ye are the children of the living God. Who else are you? Verse 2, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. So you are a dedicated, consecrated, sacred group of people. That's what holy means. Now too often these days we use holy as an exclamation of surprise or dismay. We've turned it into vanity when people are just like, oh, Holy! Look at that! Look what just happened! Can you imagine such a thing happening like that? They've turned it into a vanity when in fact holy isn't something just just general or, or, or something, um, <clears throat> what would the word be? Just, just base, just normal. Holy is something that's supposed to be dedicated, consecrated, sec sacred, different than everything else that's around it. It's not just a vanity to drop out of your mouth, but it's amazing how men tend to use things like that. They'll also say, like, holy cow, right? <laughs> Sacred cow. Why are we exclaiming these types of things? I'm not beating up on you. It's just an observation. Holy people is what we are to be. We're to be different, consecrated, sacred, peculiar, the Bible records here. Chosen. That means you were selected for a particular reason. Peculiar. That means you're special. You're unique. There's something different about you. Above all, that means you're elevated. God puts his people above all the people of the world. Okay, we ought not carry the attitude like we are something special and above everybody else and look our nose down at them. No, but nevertheless, the truth is there that God hath chosen his children to be above all the nations that are upon the earth. He set his nation so this nation is peculiar. It is chosen and it is above all the others. It says that in Exodus chapter 19 and verse four through six, you can go there again. It just iterates those same things. A peculiar people, a peculiar treasure above all people. You can make a note there, Exodus 19 and verse 4 through 6. So, as a peculiar treasure, I believe God has requirements and expectations for his own. And as any good father would, if somebody elevates their children in their life as something of importance, they know what's best for them, and quite often the child has no clue what's best for them. We use that illustration as to playing near the street, right? The father knows it's not good for the son to, to play down there, so the father makes rules and the child's expected to obey it. And God's the same way with us. He sets forth requirements for his own. And that's what we're going to see in the context of this chapter, is different requirements and expectations that the Lord has set for his people. So go back to chapter 14 and verse 1. You thought I'd just skip this. It says, ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. What in the world is that? Does that mean, does that mean we can't take care of the unibrow? We got to just let that thing go? Ladies, you got to, you know, let it, let it go. Don't be plucking those eyebrows. Make no baldness between your eyes. No, not, it's not what it means. And those three last words there, for the dead, are basically what brings that into into context okay go go ahead and, and, and pluck your eyebrows gentlemen you should probably do the same <laughs> it's probably good to just not let that thing grow but some people do they'll look at that as a law and they'll just let that thing grow right what i think actually this is referring to especially the it, it breaks it up it says thou shall not cut yourselves 
Okay, well that's pretty clear. You know, the, the pagans are into this cutting of yourselves. Anytime you, you know of a teenager that's, that's in the practice of cutting yourself, any, if any of you know somebody that was involved in that and was delivered from it, they will tell you the same, that there was some sort of demonic thing involved with cutting your flesh, Amen. harming yourself, hurting yourself. It's, it's not right, and so God puts that out there and says, don't cut yourselves. It's not good. It's not right. There's, there's something strange and unusual to that. And it's only the ones that are most tormented and hurt and suffering and going through hardships that do such things. Of course, pop culture makes some of those things cool, but it's not cool. And certainly God makes it a commandment here, don't cut yourselves. And then it says, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. Two separate commandments. What I think that baldness between your eyes is, sometimes the Bible describes body parts a little bit differently than we do. Remember how the Bible said of Jesus that they pierced his hands and his, and his feet, right? And then we see pictures of Christ with the nail right through here. And we're like, that's his wrist. Clearly that's not depicted correctly. Well, right here, there's a ton of bones running through here. So if they pierced him here, guarantee you one of them would have broken because it's just a, it's just a mesh of bones in there, okay? And the, the prophecy was that not one of his bones would be broken. Also, if you pierce somebody here and hang their weight on it, it'll just give out, okay? There's nothing here that's going to stabilize a whole body. The Bible refers to as the hands, though, actually does, in fact, start way down here. This is my hand, all of this. And so piercing Christ through there isn't a contradiction of the Scriptures. No, 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 that's, that's part of the hand. And the Bible talks about the face in different ways. So when it's saying baldness between your eyes, I think essentially you can just draw a line, and if there's any baldness kind of in between there, going around your head, in front of you, that sort of thing. It's encouraging you not to do that. And I think specifically, it's what the monks refer to as tonsure, okay? I don't, everyone's seen the monk haircut. Think of Friar Tuck, right? If you've watched Robin Hood back in the day or you've seen depictions of monks of old, and they still do it today. They'll essentially cut their hair in a strange way. They'll give themselves the, the horseshoe pattern in their haircut where there's baldness on top the monks do it as a symbol of as a symbol of their renunciation of worldly fashion or esteem and they consider that their devotion to god in other words they give themselves a weird looking haircut so like on purpose so that they can go out in public because usually this is really long it's it's like long out here and, and bald and and it, and it looks it looks unusual and they've done it on purpose because they want to look so devoted they think that's humility. In fact, that's the opposite. That's pride to go out in public. You're looking for, you're being immodest when you do something with your body to make yourself appear more holy. I think Christians ought to just pretty much look like everybody. Generally, what your average Joe would look like, there's nothing wrong with jeans and a, and a collared shirt or, or a t-shirt is fine. But when people go out of their way to, you know, the men wear a, ro a long robe and cut their hair funny or, or the women are walking around with clothing that's like a slit, that's actually not modest. That's the opposite of modesty. You're drawing attention to yourself to try to glorify the great works you're doing for your God or whatsoever it would be. So uh, biblically, I think that the monks doing tonsure is the opposite of the effect that they're trying to do. They're trying to look modest. They're trying to look, renounce, renunciate their worldly connections. And actually, they're doing something that is very carnal, that is very prideful and very immodest in actuality. And it says here, for the dead. So at the time in Deuteronomy, there was people that were doing that maybe as a symbol of their mourning. They were going to mourn, so they were going to make cuttings, and they're also going to make baldness between their eyes. And I think that that's what that is. Continuing on, God's going to get into the thou shalt not eats, okay? And all of us know about the thou shalt not eats, especially if we've ever talked with some sort of atheist. They always want to say, well, you're a Christian. Why are you eating shellfish, huh? And they're going to bring that up and, and try to condemn you with that, that sort of thing. But nevertheless, the word is here. The commands were true. What does it mean to us today? That's what we're going to look at today. So the thou shall not. Now, I'll look at the uh, first thing. It says, verse 3, thou shall not eat any abominable thing. And abominable means disgusting, refused, rejected. I mean, that's just, that makes sense. I'm not going to eat anything abominable. Sure. It gives you then a list of beasts which ye shall eat. There's an ox there. There's a sheep there. There's a goat there. Follow deer, wild goat. Who wants to have, you know, a big steak off a of pie garg? Maybe a chamoyas. I don't even know what those are, but nevertheless, they're there. You can eat them if you were in Old Testament Israel. 
every beast, it talks about how they parteth the hoof this way or that way and, and how that would allow you to eat it. Verse 8 then says this, And the swine, because it divideth the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud, it is unclean unto you, ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. So we read this and glaze over it, and rightfully so, because the New Testament teaching is eat up, right? Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. We'll get there. But... I think why God did certain things like this in the scriptures is to give, first of all, Israel uh, wisdom and guidelines that did help them, but also just maybe to give them instruction so that they could learn to follow instructions. If you think about it, today we go to school and they'll teach you problem solving. They'll teach you, okay, there is a... a, a a yard this big, you have this much fence, uh, you need to make sure one side is this big, one side of that big, right? Use trigonometry to figure out how you can have the maximum area of this yard. And then your mind is learning how to solve problems, how to rationalize, and how to break down certain parts of text. Well, back in the day, they would only have the King James Bible, really, for their instruction, by and large. They would have the law of God, and that would be above all things. Even in the foundation of our country, they used the King James Bible. Bible primarily as a teaching tool for both English and other such things. There's math problems in here, would you believe that? There's all sorts of things that teach people how to reason and how to get instruction and how to gain wisdom. So sometimes I believe that's there just to encourage us to be concise in our study of the scriptures. I don't know if you've ever tried doing it. Go to something like the different types of stones in Jesus's breastplate or in the breastplate of the priest. Study that out. I'll talk to you in a few weeks. <laughs> right? Go to something like the different types of, of uh, the, the furnishings. Try this. The furnishings of the tabernacle. Go read those portions of the end of Exodus and then sketch what you are understanding. Okay? Those things challenge your mind and help you to help you to break things down, help you to go here and there in your scriptures and figure things out. That's what it's there for in a primary sense. It's there as a as a guideline of what you shall and shall not eat. But it's also there just to, I believe, help people grow in wisdom and understanding. So the wisdom then from swine in general is that if you study them out, and I've heard this a few times, swine are generally unclean beasts, of course. They roll around in their own excrement. Also, swine are generally a low-yield type of food, meaning I will put a whole bunch of food into them Pigs will eat a whole bunch, and you won't necessarily get a ton of meat out of them in the end. Okay? So they're a low-yield type of animal. And so, yeah, it would be wise for a nomadic person that's traveling about not to keep a bunch of swine because they're going to put a whole bunch of energy into them and not get a whole bunch of good meal out of them. If you continue down, verse 9 and verse 10, it says, Thou shalt eat of all that are in the waters, all that have fins and scales you shall eat, and the ones that have... Fins and the ones that have not fins and scales, it says you shall not eat. Well, what's the wisdom there? Well, wisdom is is that fish keep well if you salt them, but some of the shellfish and those types of things, they just don't keep well. And so you're going to have a, a risk of being defiled by such things as a result of potential bacteria and they're traveling with these things. So there's just good, concise wisdom that God's trying to give his people to keep his people safe, okay? Continue on. Um, <clears throat> verse 11, it starts to talk about of clean birds you shall eat. Uh, verse 12 through verse 19, I won't read it again. These are scavengers. These are carnivores. These are different types of birds that are deemed unclean in the Levitical dietary uh, restrictions. And that's probably good wisdom because these things will eat anything. They'll pick up any carcass that was lying on the ground. They, they don't care if it's diseased or not. They're going to eat all types of filth. And what you are what you eat is, is, is one of those, those proverbs, right? You are what you eat. And so if you're going to eat a stork or, a, or an ossifrage or a cormorant or, or some type of hawk that's been just eating filth, it becomes filth. You become filth by ingesting this thing. So God says, hey, just don't eat of it. But here are birds that you can eat. And there's a good, fair list there that you can. Verse 20 says, but of all clean fowls, ye may eat. Great. So it's not like God was restricting them so much and they could just not eat anything and they're reduced to like eating eating a few beans or different types of shell or seeds or what have you. No, they had a good selection of things that God said you can eat. Now, there is wisdom here, I will say that. There is good, sound wisdom in the teachings here. And if you study out the types of animals, you can see why they would or would not be something that is good to eat. But... Is that all there is to it? I think there's more to it. You can go to Acts 
chapter 10, if you would. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Keep your finger or a bookmark or something there in Deuteronomy 14. I'm going to take us to Acts chapter 10. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon who the ends of the world are come. You stand here at the ends of the world, and everything that's recorded that happened to them is an example or an example for us, written for our admonition and our encouragement. That's why these scriptures are there. And so don't be quick to dismiss even the most common or ordinary or familiar or base lesson from the Old Testament, something that's just kind of showing Israel how to practically live. Don't dismiss that because you could be missing when you just kind of throw away clumps of Scripture. You could be missing some profound application for you today. All of those things happen to them for examples, and they're written for us upon who the ends of the world have come. And so I'm going to show you an example of this in Acts chapter 10. So again, I believe that these are, yes, wisdom. Yes, they are commands. God said, don't eat these things. And that would have been sin for them to eat some of these different types of beasts. But also, there's something more to this. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. It's interesting that this portion of scripture kicks off with Peter getting very hungry. And we're talking about dietary restrictions. And now Peter in this state is about to have a vision that I believe connects directly to the scriptures that we just read in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Verse 11 says, And saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowl of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And so Peter appeals back to the commands that he had learned from the scriptures and from his parents and from his parents' parents. This is not just tradition, Lord. This is command. I've never eaten unclean thing. And clearly that sheet came down in his vision and there was all manner of beasts present on it. Verse 15 then continues and says, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Verse 16, this was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now when Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. And so what you miss in the first portion is essentially at the same time this Cornelius was having a vision and he sent men to find Peter. And Peter's up on the rooftop and he has this great vision of a meal coming down to him and he refuses it all even though God says three times it's clean, eat it. Rise Peter, kill and eat. Rise Peter, kill and eat. Rise Peter, kill and eat. He'd known all his life that he's not to do such thing. Verse 19 says, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down. Go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And Peter was coming in. Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. So we first had the vision. Now we have the subject of the vision. Here, Cornelius, one of Caesarea, entered in 
or no, they entered into Caesarea, but he was of a far nation. So he was of the Gentile nation, Cornelius, his name gives him away, enters in and stands before Peter, seeing the man falls down before him. Now, of course, Peter says in verse 26, but Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And that's a profound statement. When I, when I saw that, I was like, wow, Peter just like gave away the whole vision and what he's about to learn in this one statement, but he didn't even realize it. So I believe God even had it that Cornelius had that confusing moment, which we see so many times in the Bible, where the man falls before a man of God, right? Not really understanding. Peter just looks at that as, I'm just a humble servant of Christ, lifts him up, says, I myself also am a man. And this is the subject that he's talking about, but this is the lesson that he's about to learn. Watch as God works in this situation, verse 27. And he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation, okay? But Peter just made that statement, I'm just a man, okay? He, he set the bar to be the same, and then he starts to ration with himself and say, it's not right for me to come in and have company with you being, what, a man of another nation? <clears throat> Watch this, though. Verse 28 in the second part. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. This happened in that moment when Peter, when he dropped his thing, his knees, and he said, "I'm, I'm just a man." Peter was like, "Ding, I'm getting it. I'm getting it, Lord. <clears throat> I'm just a man." He says, verse 29, continues on. It says, "Therefore came I to you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I ask, therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me." And Cornelius said four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. And here's the lesson he's about to learn. Verse 33. Immediately therefore I sent unto thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore art thou here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. So that's why they are assembled there, was to hear what God has revealed to Peter in this very moment. Now watch Peter. Verse 34. Remember in 26 he said, I myself also am a man. Verse 28 he said, I should call no man common or unclean. God hath showed me this. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And he continues on in his speech and in his prophecy before them, talking about how Jesus had died on the cross and how he had rose up openly before these people. Not to all the people, but a choice group of witnesses. And he's starting to realize and put it together. That's the whole reason why he showed a choice group of us, is because he wanted us to be the one that goes. Verse 43, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever, God's no respecter of persons, Whosoever, I myself also am a man, whosoever, call not any man common or unclean, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. Peter should have known this because all the prophets gave the same witness, but it finally connected with them. And how did God bring this illustration into Peter's life? By taking the understanding of common or unclean, matching them together because God says, I've cleaned them all. And he used the illustration of the Old Testament dietary restrictions to make Peter understand this. Peter, eat the meat, but that's unclean. Peter, eat the meat, but that's unclean. That's common. God says, no, I've cleaned it. Call nothing common or unclean. Once God has cleansed it, He's given them the illustration. You're all but men. There's no respect of persons with God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God, I believe, set forth a whole dietary restriction 
for a whole nation and put them under this tribute for a while to do things a certain way and to follow laws a certain way so that 2,000 years could go by. And then another 1,000 years could go by. And one apostle with a little bit of a hard head that heard it three times finally would get it and say, this is that which was spoken by the prophets. When Moses penned it, thou shalt not eat, but thou shalt not eat. There was a divide at that time, but God is showing me today. He is no respecter of persons. Call not that man common or unclean. He revealed it through what happened back then. And so, while I do believe that there is wisdom in the dietary restrictions, while I do understand that those are clear commands, they were written for our admonition upon the whom the ends of the world are come, and Peter's one of those. He looked back and said, okay, I get it. That's why God did that, was because he wanted to show there's nothing common or unclean. That's why he gave us these dietary restrictions, so that I could understand that, and Peter could be the forerunner going forth to the Jews and the Gentiles showing that truth. A lot of the Jews didn't get it. A lot of the Jews were hung up on the what's common and what's unclean. A lot of the Jews would have done the same thing as Peter did in the case of Cornelius and said, it's not right for me to eat with you, except they would actually put him out. But Peter just recognized, hey, God's showing me that we're just men. And, and that's the, that there's no difference between you and I if we're in Christ. Okay, back in Deuteronomy chapter 14. We'll go back there. Back in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 14, in verse 21, we're now there. Ye shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Isn't the word of God good? <laughs> we can take something that seemingly doesn't make a lot of sense. There's a whole sermon there. I've actually run out of time just going on that one rabbit trail with Peter. <clears throat> and here's another one. God says, you shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Thou shalt give it to the stranger... I believe that's somebody that lives locally but isn't of their nation at that time. That is in thy gates, that he may eat it, or thou mayest sell it to an alien. And I believe the alien is a traveling stranger. They're not going to settle. They're not going to establish themselves. They're just passing through. They'll go into the gates. They'll pick up what they need, and they'll carry on. So God gives provision for them to not eat of something that dieth of itself. In other words, you come outside and your cattle has fallen to the ground. Uh, two hours ago, he was okay, but now he's dead. <clears throat> now God says, hey, don't eat of it. The reason why is, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. I don't think the Lord's telling him to, them to sell, you know, bad food to the aliens and the strangers. Because so many other places, God, God teaches them to treat the strangers and the foreigners right. Have them under the same laws as you. And there should be no respect of persons even in those cases. So he's not saying, oh... Give them that rotting, dead carcass of a beast and try to swindle them and sell it to them. But unfortunately, I believe the Jews have turned it into that in a lot of ways because they don't have problem because of the Talmud and because of the other religious garbage that they teach. They have no problem selling someone something that died of itself. In other words, selling somebody some, some filth for good money, right? Just because they're an alien, just because they're a stranger. This isn't an endorsement of racism from God. Nonetheless, God just says, you're holy, so you're going to deal with that differently. That thing dies of itself. Maybe God caused that thing to die of itself so that some stranger could get a really good deal on a piece of meat. So he could care for somebody that was passing through. Or it could be given to somebody that was in need dwelling in the gate. Maybe that's why God set that up. Maybe that, that cow wasn't something that was old and decrepit and waning and then fell and then they said maybe that was like their prized cow and just for whatever reason god's like this stranger you know one like cornelius that's seeking god that's that's trying to feel after him even though he's not of the nation of israel maybe god just had it so that he's like oh this cornelius this gentile is passing through and then he just takes old bessie and knocks it out and bessie falls over and now israelites like i gotta do something with this brings it to the gate just in time to give it to that uh, Gentile alien or that Gentile stranger. I think that's probably the more reason. God's just, God's fair, and God wants to help people, and he wants to use his people to help people. Go figure. Uh, it continues on. <clears throat> and this statement comes to fruition at the end of that. You're a holy people unto the Lord your God. Thou shalt not seethe a kid 
in his mother's milk. It says it two other times in the Bible. And that is something I've asked people and I've asked pastors and I've wrestled with this. And if you know, you can tell me later. But what does that mean? What in the world does that mean? And then most of the time the pastors will just say to me or my friends will say, well, it just means don't see that kid in its mother's milk. That's all it means. And I'm like, no, there's got to be something deeper. There's got to be something to this. And you know what? I honestly don't have it yet. I don't have it figured out. But one of these things that will rattle around in my head, you know, maybe I'll have to wait till I see the Lord. Maybe that's just my one verse that will just always, always bring me to my knees, begging God to show me what in the world that was mean. But I think it is just like, in, just like a general statement to be good and fair. If you, just, if you just think about this for a moment, seething a kid in its mother's milk, okay? You're taking the baby and what the baby eats from the mother just all at once. Okay, and using it for what? Your own belly. Okay, I, I just think that that's something that just doesn't seem fair, doesn't seem right. It just, it, just, it just seems kind of like a strange thing for somebody to do. Anyways, now we're going to continue on and go to verse 22, where it says, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed. And I will say this, that statement, Thou shalt not seethe a kid in its mother's milk, is always coupled with, tithes or giving of the first fruits. So there's a clue there. Nothing to do with tithes and giving of the first fruits of your increase to God that is associated with that statement, thou shalt not seethe a kid in his mother's milk. So the tithe of your increase, and we can go to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 2 uh, and 4. We can go to Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20. And these tie together Abraham and how he gave tithes of all to Melchizedek and it connects that with a tenth of all in the New Testament statement 14 in Genesis is he gave tithes of all and it reiterates it in Hebrews chapter 7 he gave a tenth of all that he had and so again tithing is something that biblically transcends the giving of the law so here we have the tithes given in the law but before the law what, before Moses and the law came Abraham, and he was already giving a tenth to Melchizedek at that time, who was the priest. And so that is a good reason why we can believe that tithes transcends the law as well. We're not under the law, but we're under grace. But that doesn't mean we just throw out everything that we don't really like. A lot of us don't really like tithing because it has to do with our wallet in general, right? But what I believe about the New Testament, because tithe is a firm, hard number tenth. That is the letter of the law, in my opinion. The spirit of the law is such that you see in Corinthians chapter 8, where they say they gave of themselves. Or the widow in her might, she gave all that she had when she gave. So I don't believe that in the New Testament, under the spirit, a Christian that's seeking God, that has that relationship with God, that wants to give to the ministry of God, is going to have that firm, like, it's only a tenth. And they're going to be like, I don't like giving the 10th, but I'll give the 10th because legally I got to give the 10th. I think that grace giving and giving from your heart and giving all that you got and even giving of yourself is the New Testament example. Some people can't give, let's say, if it was 10% of their income, but they want to give more. So there was times when all I could do is give 10% of my income and to give more, I just really got involved in the church, did all sorts of cleaning and activities and that to give more of myself that's the teaching of the new testament in the spirit i believe we'll do more i believe that if you're able and god leads you christians will tithe 20 percent. i know christians that tithe like 50 percent of their income just because god has worked it in their lives to where they can do so and they want to do so and they do it willingly god loves a cheerful giver god doesn't want the begrudging 10 percent move the decimal to the penny throw it down and do it out of compulsion no, God wants a cheerful giver, and God exhibits his tithe, and it carries through the scriptures. But ultimately, I believe in the New Testament, it's more of a spirit, spirit matter, a heart matter than anything, not just the letter of that tenth, the letter of you better do it or God's going to whoop you, that type of thing. No, I believe God gives provision for men to work in the spirit and to give of their selves, give of their hearts, give, not just tithe and keep that hard and fast rule so what we'll see though by example in the old testament and in the law is the purpose of the tithe outlined here and i'm going to try to just rip through this as fast as i can understand we did start a little bit late so i still have 15 minutes or so 
still wanting to get you guys out on time, of course. <laughs> the purpose of the tithe. Read verse 22 and the second part of it. It says that the field bring forth year by year. The first purpose of the tithe, thou shalt tithe all the increase of thy seed, is that you would ensure that that field would continue to bring forth year by year. Well, how does that work? Well, that is because God brings the rain, God strengthens the seed, God keeps the buzzards at bay. That field is in God's hands, whether you like it or not. And if, if you talk to a lot of farmers, you don't find many atheist farmers. <laughs> you find farmers that are, that are begging God to, to care for their seed, to care for their field, to care for their farm equipment. You, you, you don't find many atheists out there. You find, you find Christians. You find, you find to, a, to a more predominant extent, you find the Mennonite type. And, you know, we don't, we don't follow their religion or anything. But you don't find atheists. That's one thing that you certainly don't find out there. Because look at this. When they give back the increase of their seed, it ensures that the field brings forth year by year. And I believe the same principle can apply to us. If I'm giving of my paycheck, I don't farm, right? So I'm not going to bring to the church house, you know, a bunch of corn and a bunch of like wheelbarrows of stuff and just drop it down here. And, you know, that's not how, how it's often done these days. But I work, I receive a wage. God gives me strength to gain wealth. And if I give of that tithe, give of that offering, it encourages that year by year, I'm going to keep receiving the same. That's a good principle that we can learn there. The next, if you read in verse 23, it says, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, of thine oil, of thy firstlings, of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And tithing teaches you. It teaches you to fear God. It teaches you to love God. It teaches you to call after God. I remember when I first got into tithing because a Baptist church taught me that that was scriptural. It was a big step of faith for me. It was hard to do. And I had to learn then to fear God. And there were hard lessons along the way when you think that you've got nothing. And my wife will tell you the story a little bit later. Maybe she's told some of you. We didn't think at one point that we could tithe. She didn't want to tithe. She was growing in her Christian life and wasn't sure that that was the responsible thing to do. You're going to bankrupt the family. And the tithe was $50 at that time. And I said, we got to give it. And I stood firm. I said, we got to give it. And then she's like, I don't want to. I can't do it. I'm scared. And I said, okay, then we won't. Well, God worked on her, made her uncomfortable a little bit, pressed on her spirit. Next thing you know, she's like, fine, we'll give it. Gives the $50. Moments later, we open our glove box and a $50 grocery gift certificate just falls out. Where did that come from? Literally one for one, we just had this thing fall upon our laps. And it was just like, thank you, Lord. And since then, she's been really faithful in that area because you understand that you got to fear God. You learn that you got to fear God. And God's not going to do that every time. It's not like you're just going to drop a $20 bill and it just shows up in your pocket instantaneously. Like, wow, that's magic. This is great. I love tithing, right? It's just, it's just one for one. But God will help you along the way as you start to learn to fear him. It's another example of how we can learn to grow in the things of God. We can continue on. It talks about the place that God chooses. It talks about verse 24, and if that place be too long or far from thee, so that thou art able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shall, watch this, thou turn it into money, and bind the money in thine hand, and thou shalt go to the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And I love this statement because it's an indictment of our current system, which is built on fraudulent, inflated money and, and, and interest rates, and there is nothing to back it. Look at that statement that's made there. It says, if the way be too long for thee, look at verse 25, then thou shalt turn it into money. That's like, I got a cow, and it's turned into money, okay? That means a one-for-one -one exchange. That means that that money that I have has something back in it. This here, monetary figure, equals to one cow. And that's how our finances were actually founded until the Federal Reserve and all this garbage snuck in. World bankers came in and took over and inflated everything and took away the one-for-one -one exchange. It used to be that one dollar was worth its weight in gold. Now one dollar is worth the paper that it's on, or for us, the plastic that it's on. It's, it's, it's worth nothing. 
It's worth what they tell you it's worth. But God's system's clear. Hey, if you can't haul that cow all the way down to give it the one-tenth of your whole herd or whatever it is, just one-to-one -one exchange cow for money worth of cow, carry that in your hands, and that's fine. When you get down there, do what you do, you give it to them, and they give you one cow back. It's just a one-for-one -one exchange. There's no interest. There's no tax. Tax was done differently in their days, and, and tax wasn't even given by God. The, the tax was the tithe, and all that that tax did, the tithe did, was it ensured what? That your field would bring forth year by year. It ensured what? That you learn to fear God, and that can only help you because that strengthens you, that, that, that is the beginning of wisdom, that is the beginning of knowledge, that is the beginning of understanding. The tithe, 10% tax, let's say, that God asked of his people only helped his people. Our, our taxes don't do that, and, and wouldn't it be great if it was only 10%? Man, Caesar takes like half of my, my paycheck. See, Caesar, Caesar just, just gouges you, and he doesn't benefit you. That, that stuff gets taxed when it gets off the ship. It gets taxed when it goes in the store. It gets taxed when I buy it. It gets taxed when I exchange it. Caesar's just like, I'm in the money. He just, he just brings it in. He's just... But that's not how God works. God wanted money to be backed by something. Money needs to have a substitute for a tangible item. That's all it was for, was for the convenience of not having to carry a cow when you're going to exchange a cow for seed, or when you're going to tie the cow unto the Lord. It was just a simpler increment. In verse 26, And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. There's when you bring that money, and what do you do? You exchange it for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before thy Lord, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. Again, you see, the third great purpose of the tithe is to bring rejoicing to God's people. It brought people together to fellowship and to come together so that they could give and they could continue on back on their merry way. And what are they returning to after they travel all that way? Give, rejoice, celebrate the love of God. They get to return back to fields that are bringing forth year by year. They get to return back to a fear of God that brings wisdom to their selves and to their families. Verse 27, And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. So that was, again, Another primary reason. So the purpose of the tithe brings forth fruit, feeds you, gives you the fear of God and helps you to grow in that, helps you to rejoice. Also is provision for God's people. Because like I said about the Levites, they had no inheritance. Their inheritance was the Lord. So when you came down to the house of God and you tithed and you celebrated and you ate as a people, that was charity, love, that was giving to God's people in order that they could continue to provide the service that they had there. Finally, in verse 28, And at the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase, the same year thou shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied. And you see, it's not a welfare system, but it's a system that certainly does provide for strangers, provides for widows, surprise, provides for orphans. It provides for God's people that are serving in the house of God. That, that was the whole purpose of this thing. And look, it continues, that the Lord thy God may bless thee. Look, you're blessing others in that form of giving. And the, in the end, what is comes back on you? That the Lord thy God may bless thee and all the work of thine hand, which the Lord, which thou doest. So we want the blessings of God in our life. We want God to bless us when we go and labor, when we go and work. And if we want that, then we not understand that this is how God's economy works. Certainly Caesar's got his fingers in that. Caesar wants to get every piece that he gets. You get tax upon tax upon tax upon tax. But God still expects his people to give sacrificially unto him, to just give what's expected. And you know what is the most important thing to give in God's economy? Yourself. Present yourselves a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If I'm willing to give of myself, then part of my paycheck is nothing. What's more important to me than me, right? That's how we have to rationalize it. God wants you. God wants you. God wants you. God wants all of us given in service unto him. So we need to put that into perspective and understand, is my time more valuable than me to me? Is my money more valuable to me than me? Is 
is, is my, my giving and, and, and my prayers to people. Because that's another sacrifice in the Bible, praying one for another, praying for God's minister, praying for God's ministry to go forward. It's another way that you can sacrifice yourself unto God, and ultimately that's what he wants, is us to give of ourselves. So we see there's some good teaching in this passage of scriptures that sometimes, I'm guilty of the same, we often glaze over. But look, God very clearly says that all men are the same, same playing field. We are all one. We are all available and have the same salvation. There is no respect of persons with God. And next, he just wants each one of these men who are all the same, there's no respect of persons among us, to just give of themselves as is intended and as he desires. Amen?